Okay, uh, welcome everyone on behalf of the Cancer Center. Um, I'm delighted to <coughs> host our two Cancer Center Grand Round speakers today. Our first is Amy Justice. Amy is Professor of Medicine and of Public Health, and she's focused her career on <coughs> research on outcomes in chronic HIV infection. Her goal is to use living with HIV infection as a model for understanding and improving outcomes in chronic disease. Uh, Dr. Justice is PI on the Veterans Aging Cohort Study. She's received many years of funding and was recently funded as a consortium by the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism at NIH. Uh, today, Professor Justice will present on HIV and advanced age on chartered territory. Thank you, Amy. Hi, I'm very happy to have an interactive talk. I don't necessarily need to get through all my slides. It's more important that you engage with the material, so please don't hesitate to ask questions. Oh, how do I get out of this? Let's see. Just cancel. So middle age uh, among those aging with HIV is actually pretty well characterized right now. Uh, everywhere where antiretroviral therapy is available, people are aging with HIV. Uh, and interestingly, in resource rich, rich setting, aging is not a new phenomenon. But in resource poor setting, settings, aging in and of itself is a new phenomenon. And it is combined in very large numbers with people aging with HIV, which makes it a very interesting issue in places like Africa. Uh, in, according to the Centers for Disease Control, age in HIV up to 2014, we now have 18% of new diagnoses among people who are 50 years of age and over. And for those of you who do cancer research, you may say 50. Wait a minute, that's not really aging. But that is, in fact, what the um, NIH deemed to be a demar demarcation of aging with HIV. And only recently have we got larger numbers than 65 and over, as I will show you. 45% of those who are living with HIV are now 50 years of age and over as of 2015. And 65% of those dying with HIV are now 50 years of age and over. And I think that's also very relevant for those of us who work in complex chronic disease because we often see people close to the end of their lives. But what about more advanced age? What about 65 and over, which is usually the threshold that we talk about aging in? Uh, there really isn't very much known about that. 15% of those who are dying with HIV are 65 and over, 6% of those who are living with HIV, and 2% of new infections occur in that age group. So there's really a great deal yet to be learned. And I think this is particularly germane to people interested in cancer research, because as most people in this room probably are aware, cancer's association with age is not linear. Uh, many cancers increase dramatically after 65 years of age and over. And so if we're really going to understand the patterns of cancer that are and are not associated with HIV, we need larger numbers in that age group. And just to tantalize you a little bit, um, this is some data that now is somewhat old. This was based on up to 2010. Uh, uh, we collaborated with Carrie Alt Altoff at Hopkins to look at risk for particular cancers by age among those with and without HIV infection. And what we found was that rather than having early increased risk, we saw later increased risk relative to the control. So as people got older with HIV, their relative risk of cancers increased did not compared to age-matched uninfected individuals. So it's more like accentuated aging rather than accelerated aging. And this is, of course, very interesting as we begin to think about people who are 65 years of age and over. So yet to be charted among those aging with HIV, does presentation differ in older versus younger individuals? In what ways are aging with HIV sicker than uninfected individuals? How do we differentiate true age effects versus cohort effects? Changes from aging versus exposures, such as to what extent is persistent inflammation due to aging with HIV and suboptimal treatment. Remembering that the people who are older are also have more likely to have been exposed to what we call the bad drugs, the D drugs, that had mitochondrial toxicity um, 
and other very major side effects. And finally, what does this mean for cancers more typical of advanced age? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Veterans Aging Cohort Study, the larger context of aging with HIV, and then try to cone in on HIV and cancer in the art era. And the reason I've drawn the Venn diagrams in this asymmetric way is that the overlap between cancer and aging is very, very large. Uh, and the overlap between cancer, aging, and HIV is just beginning. Uh, and I must give uh, credit to all the people I collaborate with. We have over 75 investigators across the United States and in Europe who work with us on a daily basis, and this work could not have been done without all of their input. The Veterans Aging Cohort Study is built on the National VA Electronic Health Record. It's prospective. It's a living cohort, which is updated annually. We have currently 52,000 HIV-infected individuals, two matched, I mean, matched to two controls based on age, race, site, and gender. So over 110,000 controls. It's been continuously funded since 1998 by the NIH, mostly by the NIAAA, but more recently by NCI as well. We've produced over 350 publications, and we've helped train over 150 investigators, including over 10 PhD dissertations, which I'm very proud of. Our data is increasingly rich. Uh, it begins with the EHR data, which includes, of course, administrative data, but also includes laboratory data, pharmacy data, progress notes, radiology reports, pathology reports, et cetera. We then have supplemented that with Medicare and Medicaid CMS data, so we know about outside utilization and outside diagnoses. About 20% of outside care occurs among those in the, in the VA, so it's very important to be able to capture those events on the outside. We also have patient surveys, sub-studies and provider surveys in a subset of patients, and we've, we've pulled data from the National Death Index, so we have cause of death data. Of greatest interest probably to this audience is that we have the VA Central Cancer Registry data on all of these patients. We have GWAS and proteomics and CD profiles on a subset in our tissue bank. And we have recently begun to develop a virtual tissue repository, which I will explain more in a few minutes. We also have a fairly well-organized administrative structure so that uh, we have decentralized leadership uh, distributed among cores and work groups, and I'll speak a little bit more specifically about that in a minute. So here's some data from the Veterans Aging Cohort Study. We looked at HIV-positive incidents by age. In other words, people presenting to the VA. Now, that doesn't mean that they didn't know they were HIV-positive, but when they presented, they had detectable viral loads and were not on antiretroviral therapy. So they had not really been integrated into care yet. And as you can see, from 1997 to 2015, there's been a real migration. The group of people who are presenting to the VA for care are getting older every year. And in fact, now there's almost a bimodal distribution. If you look at this, this sort of light blue line here, you see there's sort of a peak in the older group, and a, a younger group and a peak in the older group. Oh, thanks. So what about differences in presentation? I think this is a really important question because we often miss the diagnosis in people who are older with HIV. And why might that be? Well, because older people present looking much more like other older people frequently than, than like younger people with HIV. Uh, as you can see here, I've done, uh, we have a gradated uh, for, less than 40, 40 to 49, 50 to 59, and 60 plus years of age. So that 60 plus is the light. The youngest group is the darkest. And what we've done is we've looked at the odds ratios for presentation at that, with that condition, making uh, less than 40 the comparator group. So they're one across the board, as you can see there. And you can see that for every single condition, the chances that people will present with that condition when they are older for initial treatment for their HIV is substantially greater than when they are younger. So there are many more presenting with AIDS diagnoses, which suggests delayed diagnosis. Many more presenting with CD4 count less than 200, also suggesting delayed diagnosis. Uh, higher viral loads at presentation. But also, community-acquired pneumonia is much more common in older individuals than in younger individuals at presentation. Zoster is also much more common, as is uh, lymphocytopenia. Anemia, severe anemia, and this is probably of interest to the oncology group because these folks get referred for bone marrow biopsies rather than getting HIV tests sent, and uh, low platelets. 
So uh, you may be saying, well, what about people without HIV? Are they equally likely to have these conditions? And the answer is no, they are not. They are dramatically less likely to have these conditions when they are in care. So it's both more common among those who are older with HIV to present with these conditions, and when compared with age-matched controls, these, these conditions are much more common in those with HIV. Unfortunately, they're not diagnostic of HIV, so that it still takes time for the providers to think of sending an HIV test unless they do that routinely. Middle-aged HIV-positive individuals are also sicker, both um, and by sicker I mean physiologically more frail than younger HIV-positive patients and demographically similar uninfected patients. Here's the 10-year decreased life expectancy among older HIV-positive individuals in the modern era. So these are people who have had opportunities to be exposed to antiretroviral therapy. And you can see that we're getting better. Here's the controls. And here are the folks back in 1996 to 2000. And in the more recent years, we are beginning to approach those of a life expectancy without HIV. But there's still a substantial separation. And this separation continues to the modern day. And as I pointed out already, they have delayed treatment. They come in lo with lower CD4 counts and lower thresholds for CD4. Now, this is a complex slide, and I'm, because I only have 30 minutes to present to you, I'm not going to walk you through all of it. But basically, what this is showing you is that markers of inflammation uh, are very elevated in people when they first come into care before they get antiretroviral therapy. Many of those markers come down after antiretroviral therapy but many do not normalize. In other words, they do not return to where they were in the individual prior to their infection or in age-matched individuals. So there is ongoing inflammation even among people who achieve viral suppression. That inflammation, however, um, while it does influence CD4 and CD8, it does not interact with HIV. So it's an additive effect to the aging effect. It's not an interactive effect. And this is, uh, this is work that has been recently uh, accepted and published online using the CD profiles from the VAX index, I mean, from the VAX cohort study. Inflammation predicts a number of diseases in those with HIV, including overall mortality, cardiovascular disease, cancer, venous thromboembolism, type 2 diabetes, COPD, renal disease, bacterial pneumonia, con cognitive dysfunction, <laughs> depression, and frailty, and in many cases, differentially so. In other words, it has a stronger effect on those outcomes among HIV positives than among controls. So it appears to be playing a larger role. It's not a unique role, but it is a more dominant role. Add to that the fact that people with HIV infection who enter care and start antiretroviral therapy experience polypharmacy dramatically earlier than people without HIV. So this is again from the VAX study showing that the med count among uninfected versus infected is higher at every age group um, than the in controls. So that raises the larger question of how do we measure physiologic frailty or degree of sickness in people who are aging with HIV. It's a complicated picture. CD4 and viral load alone or age alone don't really tell you how sick any given individual is. And for this reason, we developed the VAX index to try to capture the, the multiple effects of the phenomenon that are going on physiologically for people who are aging with HIV which include immune dysfunction and senescence, microbial translocation, chronic inflammation, platelet hypercoagulability, HIV and non-HIV treatment toxicity, oxidative stress, and assorted comorbid diseases, including viral hepatitis, substance use, and HIV itself. The goal being that we could then compare equally sick people in terms of benefits from treatment. The components of the VAX index include age, CD4 cell count, viral load, hemoglobin, FIB4, which is a measure of liver fibrosis, estimated GFR, and hepatitis C infection. And we are going to be currently working on what it means to have your hep C infection cleared in terms of the prognostic index as we get more data. Here is how well the VAX index predicts outcomes, both in its original development cohort, which was the VAX cohort, and this is in a totally independent group, the NA Accord Cross Cohort Collaboration. The line tells you the predicted outcome. The, the dots with the confidence intervals show you the actual observations. You can see that the fit was really quite good in VAX, but it was also quite good in any accord. 
We then looked at important subgroups, including those under and over 50, men, women, black, white patients, those with undetectable viral load, and those with detectable viral load. And in all these subgroups, the index worked quite well in terms of predicting mortality. This is all-cause mortality. It's also highly associated with the markers of inflammation that we were talking about, CD4, uh, and, and the index overall is more associated with IL-6, soluble CD14, and D-dimer than any subgroups of the index or subcomponents of the index. Now, why do we need to measure how sick somebody is? If we want to understand the effects of our treatment, we really need to be able to compare equally sick people at baseline, and that gets increasingly challenging in an older population with multimorbidity. If we can adjust for how sick they are at baseline, we can then begin to look at effects like polypharmacy, any particular exposure or treatment. And as we get into the era of large database analyses where we try to understand treatment toxicities using observational data, that is going to be particularly important because we're not randomizing. So people get medications for particular reasons. You need to adjust for how sick they are if you want to understand the outcomes, both beneficial and harmful. This is data that has just been accepted to AIDS and is impressed, adjusting for the VAX index, looking at the number of medications that an individual is on that are non-ARV medications, and showing that both in positives, in the dark circles, and in controls, the light circles, there is a dose-response association between the number of medications you're on and your risk of hospitalization and mortality, and that that association remains fairly stable after adjusting for demographics and severity of illness. So here's the unadjusted, and here's the adjusted. Uh, stay tuned for VAX 2.0. We're adding BMI, white blood cell count, and albumin. The C statistic is going from about 0.71 to 0.80, which makes it the best predictive model that I think has been published in terms of long-term outcomes. So age and HIV treatment. Treatment's delayed. We see equal efficacy across classes. We see better adherence with older individuals and rapid viral suppression, but a more sluggish CD4 response up to three years after initiation of antiretroviral therapy. We see greater susceptibility to toxicity, pre-existing organ system injury, neurocognitive effects, which are intensified with age, non-ARV polypharmacy, as I showed you, and can continued substance use, and that's very important. These individuals do not necessarily stop drinking or stop using uh, substances. Uh, HIV and cancer in 2018, here are some time trends to give you a sense of which cancers are on the rise and which cancers seem to be decreasing in populations who are largely exposed to antiretroviral treatment. You can see that Kaposi's sarcoma is decreasing, but liver cancer, colorectal cancer, anal cancer, lung cancer, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, well, not so much non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but lung cancer are all increasing. Uh, one of the cores that's been extremely active is our VAX Cancer Corps. Rob DeBrow was the founding director. Now Leslie Park and Keith Siegel are directing it. Roxanne Wadia is leading a very active working group on prostate cancer. I uh, showed some of this data at a prior cancer meeting, but the important things here are that uh, the trends for cancer events overall are increasing both in positives and in negatives because people are, li are living to older ages. When you adjust for risk factors, you see that there is a decrease overall and that that decrease has been particularly steep among those with HIV. So treating HIV decreases overall risk of cancer after you adjust for age. But those with HIV remain at excess risk even after you suppress the virus. So here's AIDS defining cancers. Uh, based on whether or not the virus is suppressed, you can see the highest risk is among those people who do not have suppressed virus with decreasing risk after you suppress. The intermediate bar is short-term suppression. The lighter pink bar is long-term suppression. And you can see a dose-response association with all the different categories of cancer. But of note, there is still substantial residual risk of cancer, even in those who have suppressed virus. The exception being prostate cancer, and we're still trying to figure out if that's a real phenomenon or it has to do with screening. Uh, so stay tuned on that question. That's one of the reasons Roxanne is leading that work group. To understand, there it is. 
Inflammation, pneumonia, and lung cancer. This is a study that was recently published by Keith Siegel in the Lancet HIV, demonstrating that we do have excess risk of lung cancer among people who have repeated bouts of bacterial pneumonia after adjust for smoking and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is particularly of note since HIV-infected individuals are at increased risk for pneumonia even in the current era, even after their uh, viral load is suppressed. <laughs> Our liver core has also been working with the cancer group, and we currently, our NCI funding is from the Provocative Questions RFA. We have been making some nice progress. We're a year into this grant now. Uh, the goal of this grant, and this is the virtual tissue repository that I was talking about, the goal of this grant is to identify people who have had liver biopsies stored at path labs across the country in the VA and request those samples for scientific analysis. We can do that because, because the VA has the national electronic record. We can identify who has had a path biopsy and a diagnosis of liver cancer, and then contact the pathologist and request the samples. Obviously, this has taken a while to set up, to get the IRB approvals, to get the pathologist comfortable with it. But at this point, we have a goal and over the five years of having 300 specimens. We currently have 105. Uh, we have a goal of getting all of those specimens read in a blinded fashion by two pathologists. They have completed 35. The one pathologist has completed 50. Uh, our aims are to both use large database analyses to address these questions and then to cone down in the samples that we have the actual path specimens to see if we get different answers to these questions when we have uh, cleaner, more validated data. So I'm going to go a little quicker through this because I want to be respectful of the time. This is, I think, the most important message. We've done an analysis of the PATH reports on the patients that we identified having PATH specimens to try to get an early sense of whether or not there are important differences by HIV status. And the most important thing I think we've found so far is that the PATH report quality differed by HIV status so that people who had HIV were less likely to have their full staging recorded in the PATH report than people who did not have HIV. Now, we can think of lots of reasons why that might be true, but I think it underscores why it's so important to have independent readings blinded to HIV status to understand whether or not there is an important phenomenon going on here. As you can see, if you just simply redistributed the not reported a little asymmetrically among these stages, you'd see some pretty strong differences by HIV status. The same is true, by the way, for Gleason scores. So there are a number of questions that need to be answered in terms of cancer treatment in those with HIV. What about treatment disparities? We are seeing definite indications that there are treatment disparities. What about postoperative infections? Are they at increased risk? Or how do we determine who is at most increased risk for postoperative infections after cancer surgery? What about level of physiologic frailty and toxicity, and how does that interact with treatment? What about interactions with art and polypharmacy? And what about iris? That's an acute inflammatory reaction or immunologic reaction after you initially start antiretroviral therapy, which can be quite pronounced for certain infections. TB is one that's been well described. And how is that going to influence people's response to checkpoint inhibitors? Could they also interact in important ways, which I think is a very interesting question. And finally, what about secondary cancers from treatment? So what's the future for HIV aging and cancer trends? HIV incidence will rise among those aging 50 to 65 years of age. Presentations may differ substantially from younger individuals, and we need to be aware of that. Care for suppressed, for suppressed individuals would be mainstreamed, probably switched out of infectious disease clinics and back to primary care. Aging HIV positives will have excess incidence of lung cancer due to their bacterial pneumonias, continued smoking, and perhaps residual risk. Liver cancer due to the my microbial translocation, hep C, hep B co-infections, alcohol use and medication toxicity, as well as underlying risk from HIV, and <clears throat> other virally related cancers, including anal and possibly head and neck, which is another one that would be interesting to explore. Excess incidence may grow in advanced ages, and we need to look at that. For those of you who are interested in collaborating with us, we have a website with a lot of information, uh, both about samples and about data. And we need to acknowledge our funders and um, the people who've contributed. So, thank you. Thank you for this. Thank you. We have, we have time for a bunch of questions on this. OK. No questions. I, I have to wonder, since <coughs> everyone's wondering about this, um, you have a lot of smokers in your 
cohort, so I, and I imagine with checkpoint inhibitors as first-line therapies, there may be some sense now of how this is playing out for them? Uh, we are starting to try to look at that. I can't give you an answer yet, but we have identified who's receiving checkpoint inhibitors, and Keith Siegel is quite interested in, in looking at that question. We actually had a clinical scholar who was interested in looking at question last year, and we ended up losing her to another university, so we had to start over again. That, that should never happen. Never happen. I agree. Yes, it is. So uh, in the survey subsample, which is about 7,000 patients, we have data on use of herbal supplements. And you're right, it is fairly common. It doesn't really vary dramatically by HIV status. Um, so in a sense, you could bump the numbers up in both groups. Uh, but it certainly is prevalent. You're absolutely right. So in other words, does the herbal medicine influence the outcome? Uh, we don't have sufficient power to really look at that. Again, it's only in the survey subset. It's only about 7,000 patients. And the effect size is relatively modest for treatments like herbal medicine. So we don't really have the power to detect a 20% difference in that subsample. So I'm afraid I can't answer that question. Hi, gosh, since this is a veteran cohort, have you considered uh, Sure. PTSD is about 15% in both positives and negatives. Uh, it's not lar uh, more prevalent in the HIV positives. Uh, we certainly have looked at a great deal of substance use and tried to characterize that. I actually took some of those slides out in, in the interest of time. Uh, one nice thing in the VA is that every year when a veteran comes in, there is an audit C collected which quantifies quantity and frequency of alcohol use. There's also questions about uh, traumatic brain injury, about depression, about quality of life. And so we have used some of those items to try to characterize behaviors. Smoking is also recorded every year. And we have been able to characterize people pretty reproducibly. And we actually have a study now comparing our self-reported smoking trajectories with methylation data that shows an excellent correlation, which makes me even more confident that we, we know who's a smoker and who isn't. <laughs> That's a great question. We're looking at that right now, so stay tuned. I think that's a great question. You know, there, there's data outside of the VA and other studies suggesting that liver cancer is more of a problem in white patients than in black patients. Uh, and it gets challenging to tease out hepatitis C, alcoholism, fatty liver, you know, all the different components. We may be able to do that in this study because it's a large enough sample that we actually can begin to stratify by those factors to look for important action, interactions by race. And we definitely want to do that. The reason I ask is that there is a Caucasian gene that increases the toxicity of alcohol. So in the Million Veteran Program, which I'm also involved in, uh, we have now 600,000 veterans enrolled for whom we're doing GWAS. Um, so it would be interesting to look at that question in that group. We could also characterize what medications they had been exposed to. And I am eager to, to do some of that work. I think there's a lot to be done around polypharmacy. OK. Well, if there are no other questions, I'd like to thank you again. Second speaker.
speaker today is Ms. Koka. He's an associate professor of pediatrics and genetics. Dr. Koka's research focuses on how embryonic patterns All right, so uh, <clears throat> here's the outline of my talk. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, the interactions between, I actually, to be honest, uh, was wondering why you guys invited a pediatric critical care physician who studies developmental biology to cancer rounds. But it turns out that cancer and developmental biology have some nice connections, which I hope by the end of this talk will be very clear to you. Uh, so I'll talk about the RAPGA5 and sort of the future of, of uh, where I think some of this stuff will go. So cancer and developmental biology go back, way back. So you know the original cancer genes were identified by uh, a number of groups, but Noose and Varma actually did this cool experiment where they had provirus integration, MMTV, in, and looked for mammary tumors in mice. So I guess this virus actually causes nearby genes to overexpress. And they found uh, that a lot of the integrations were occurring next to this gene. I mean, look at this. I mean, hardcore whiteout, right? They actually found that the exons here uh, coded this new gene called INT1. And so they identified this gene as INT1, that overexpression of INT1 would lead to these mammary tumors. And so shortly thereafter, well, not shortly thereafter, seven years later, uh, McMahon and Moon decided to take this INT1 gene and inject it into a frog embryo and see what would happen. Presumably, they would inject this into a frog embryo and get uh, big tumors growing out. But in fact, they saw a two-headed frog. So here's the tail, here's the head as it comes around. There's two heads here. Actually, nowadays, we can do that a little bit prettier. And so you can see this beautiful double-headed frog by injecting of this one molecule called INT1. And so I think what's really important here is that in the adult context, when you overexpress a potent gene like INT1, you get cancer. But in the embryonic context, when you inject a potent gene like INT1, you get craziness, right? So double axis embryos, there's incredible patterning that occurs. So of course now we know that INT1 is actually a WINT. It's a, it's a, a part of the WINT pathway, and the WINT is really critical for colon cancer. So we know that, well you guys know all this better than I do, that colon cancer is a big problem. And then if you look at the genetics of colon cancer, it turns out that APC, axon 1 and 2, and beta catenin are the most commonly hit genes. So here's the WINT pathway. Let me integrate. So for those that don't know, so uh, in the context of no Wnt ligand, uh, there's this big uh, beta catenin degradation complex that includes axin and GSK3, APC, that lead to the degradation of beta catenin. And with the, uh, with the uh, arrival of a Wnt ligand, these, this complex is, is, is uh, sequestered up at the membrane, and beta catenin is now no longer degraded and then can go into the nucleus. And the context of adult cells will give you cell growth. And in the context of an embryonic cell, we'll give you two-headed frogs. And so what's really interesting about this is that beta catenin is really critical here and that the degradation of beta catenin uh, is critical for regulating these processes and that most of the mutations, that, uh, many of the mutations that colon cancer are really affected here. Uh, that, you know, APC is very common, acts in beta catenin. It's really leading to stabilization of beta catenin. And so if you want to think about cancer therapeutics here, one thing that would be really cool is to be able to block all of these molecules downstream, right? Block beta catenin entry into the nucleus. And in fact, that's one of the problems is we don't actually know how beta catenin gets into the nucleus. Okay, so our approach to this problem is completely different. So uh, I do pediatric critical care, and one of the things that we see in the ICU is children with congenital heart disease, for example, especially a kind of congenital heart disease called heterotaxy. So this is a seven-year-old boy that presented the, the PICU here. You can see that he clearly has problems in left-right patterning. So his heart is on the right side, which is the wrong side. Uh, if you follow this NG tube, it actually goes to his stomach, which is also on the right side instead of the left. And you can see that this diaphragm is higher than this one because his liver is also on the wrong side. But this kid doesn't just have situs inversus. He actually has a large, unbalanced AV canal. And so blood flow is, com is totally inappropriate. And in fact, the surgeons have connected his left superior vena cava directly to his lungs. 
so that we can separate his circulations and allow his heart to pump blood to his body. So he's had a number of surgeries, which you can see the stitches in his sternum here at the age of seven years to really reconstruct his heart. And one of the challenges for us as an ICU physician is that we're always getting questions by family saying, why did this happen to my child? And will this happen to my next child? For the longest time, we didn't know. But now, with the new genomic analyses that you can do, you can start to dig into it, do sequencing and identify it. So back in 2011, the dark ages of, of genomics, we actually did CNV analysis. And at that time, it was too expensive to do exome sequencing. And now, of course, everyone's doing exome sequencing because it costs almost nothing. And so we identified an internal duplication in a patient with heterotaxy in a gene called RAPGEF5. So you can see right here, there's a duplication between exon 2 and 6. And of course, Monica just told you about 50,000 patients, and we have one patient, one patient with this mutation. And so one of the questions you have to ask is, what does that mean? In fact, one of the challenges, we don't know actually what RAPGEF5 does in development. And so it's even hard to understand if this makes any sense at all. And so one of the questions we do is try to figure out what this gene does and see if it makes sense in the context of the disease process that this child has. So what is RAPGEF5? RAPGEF5 is a guanine nucleotide exchange factor. So like many other proteins, RAPs are in an inactive state in the GDP form. The GEF then uh, adds a, a phosphate to it so that it becomes an active RAP GTP form. There are presumably gaps. There are gaps that actually do the opposite. And so they activate the small GTPases. RAPs turn out to be known for to be cell adhesion and wind signaling, but RAPGEF5 has no known function in developmental biology. We do know that it has a biochemical activity that can do this GEF, but what it does in, in an embryo is completely unknown. So our approach to this is to use frogs. So just like uh, McMahon and Moon, we ask the question, how does RAPGEF5 alter LR patterning? And so the way we do that in frogs <clears throat> is we'll inject nowadays is CRISPR. So for like 35 bucks, we can inject this into the frog embryo in about two or three hours. We get biallelic modifications of the frog genome. And so three days later, in that same embryo, we can make a total knockout of the frog and see what the gene does. And so that's very powerful for us because it's very quick and easy and cheap to make a knockout in a frog. And then we could read the heart. So here's a normal D loop like, our, our, like we have. Here's an L loop like that patient that has. You can see the heart is actually a mirror image of this one. And so we can then very easily flip those embryos over. Here's the eyes, the head. We can look at the heart, flip them over, and, and immediately score heart looping and see if they have heterotaxy. OK, so RAPGIF5. So I have to do something dramatic. I'd like to get to the wind signaling part, so I'm going to summarize some of the data that got us to wind signaling. So if we knock out RAPGIF5 in frogs, we do affect LR patterning. So left-right patterning is screwed up, just like in our patients. That means cardiac looping is abnormal. In fact, even earlier steps of global left-right patterning, the whole left-right axis of the embryo is abnormal. And that's really because the left-right organizer is mispatterned in these embryos. So that actually turns out to be really a, a problem in gastrulation. And so when we looked at RAPGEF5, we found that depletion really affected specific genes that were affected in the gastrula. Those genes like FOXJ1 and XNR3, turned out that those genes were Wnt-responsive genes, specifically Wnt-responsive genes. And that led us to think about beta catenin. So of course, as I mentioned before, beta catenin is critical for Wnt pathway. And so we did a Western blot. So here we're using morpholinos to knock down the gene. So here at RAPGEF5 depletion, here's our control. You can see that there's a reduction in the amount of total beta catenin and a really dramatic reduction in the amount of active beta catenin. Of course, if we inject RAPGEF5 human RNA, you can see that there's increase in beta catenin, suggesting that something with the Wnt pathway is, is going abnormal. OK, so that sort of connected RAPGEF5 to wind signaling, but of course, where in wind signaling? And that was one of the things we were trying to figure out next. So as I mentioned in, in previously, this is the wind pathway with the wind ligand binds. It, uh, it, it, it sequesters this degradation complex, and beta catenin can go into the nucleus. In the context of, of no wind signal, you get degradation of beta catenin. And since we saw less beta catenin in our embryos, we thought maybe RAPGEF5 is affecting degradation. With the loss of RAPGEF5, you get additional degradation of beta catenin. And so we went to test that. And in frogs, the cool way to test that is, of course, to make two-headed embryos. So we can inject beta catenin MRI into frogs and make two-headed embryos, and then deplete RAPGEF5 and ask, do we get more one-headed embryos? So here you can see in our controls that were uninjected completely, there's very low incidence of two-headedness. That's good. One head is what you're supposed to have. But if you now inject uh, beta catenin in, you can see that roughly 50% of the embryos have two heads. 
If we now inject GSK3, remember this is a beta catenin degrader, you get less two-headedness. And if you inject RAPGA5 morpholino, deplete RAPGA5, again, you get a reduction in two-headedness. So this really suggests that beta catenin is acting like GSK3. Maybe we thought it was part of the degradation complex. Now, one of the things about beta catenin that's interesting is that there's these phosphorylation sites that are really critical for its degradation. So you can make a beta catenin that has mutated these sites so that it doesn't degrade anymore. It's a stabilized form of beta catenin. It doesn't degrade anymore. And so we ask the question, well, if we use this beta catenin, what happens with GSK3? Oh, sorry, what happens with RAPGA5 depletion? So you can see that this stabilized beta catenin, when we inject it into the frog embryo, it gives us more secondary axes, right? It's, it's not de being degraded anymore, and so its potency for inducing secondary axes goes up. If we now inject GSK3, it no longer can degrade this beta catenin, so there's really no effect here, right? There's the same amount of secondary axes here. And what happens if we deplete RAPG5? We still have an effect, right? So still, RAPG5 still can block even the stabilized form of beta that made us think that something different is going on here. Because we would have predicted that the stabilized form of beta catenin would also have been uh, unaffected when we depleted RAPG5 if it was a degradation machine. So then we started wondering if could it be something different. So if it's not degradation, we know it's affecting beta catenin. If it's not degradation, what could it be? We started wondering could it be the nuclear translocation of beta catenin? And that's interesting because we know a lot about how molecules get in and out of the nucleus if they are part of this NLS important RAN mediated system. So there's cargo that's NLS that has a nuclear localization signal on it that binds to important, goes into the nucleus. RAN then helps uh, export it or dump the cargo. And you have this beautiful pathway, actually, for nuclear transport uh, if you have a nice NLS signal. But on the other hand, beta catenin doesn't have an NLS signal. In fact, it's completely independent of an important RAN. You could wipe out the system completely, and beta catenin will still go into the nucleus. But there are some similarities. For example, we know that beta catenin does require nuclear pores, so it doesn't uh, go through the membrane or anything. It does require the nuclear pores, just like the RAN important system. It also requires energy. ATP, GTP is necessary for it to occur. And it turns out there are arm repeat, there are heat repeats on beta catenin. They're very similar to the armadillo repeats in imp importance. So there's some similarities there. And actually, that has led many people to predict that there must be a GTPase that must mediate beta catenin uh, lo nuclear localization. But what that is is unknown. And so we speculated that it might be RAPG5. To test this question, we actually then added NLS a nuclear localization signal from SV40, it's a known <laughs> nuclear localization signal, onto beta catenin and asked what happens now in our secondary access study. So here we use NLS beta catenin. Remember, if, if now beta catenin, if RAPG5 is using the nuclear transport of beta catenin, if we now put an NLS signal, it should use the important system. And so what happens if we deplete RAPG5? And you can see now, finally, we get no effect. Right? And so this made us think that there's really an independent transport pathway for beta catenin. OK, so there's a lot of data here I need to summarize that support that result. So the other thing we looked at is G GFP beta catenin localization. So you can nicely label beta catenin with GFP and then look at its localization. And if we look at either wild type, stabilized, or NLS beta catenin, RAPG5 will block both the wild type and stabilized nuclear transport of beta catenin, but not the NLS beta catenin. We can also deplete, uh, we can also block GSK3. So put, make a situation where we have too much beta catenin in the embryo uh, by blocking the, deg the degradation pathway. And in that case, RAPG5 still rescues it. It can still block uh, wind signaling in the context of blocking degradation. So clearly, it must be downstream of that process. And then finally, we looked at native beta catenin. And all of these were sort of overexpressing beta catenin. Here we then actually did nuclear cytoplasmic fractions. And you can see that even though there's a slightly less beta catenin than depletion embryos, the amount in the nucleus is dramatically less, again, suggesting that there's a reduction in the uh, nuclear transport of beta catenin. So this gives us a working model that beta catenin, uh, that RAPG5 acts to activate RAPS, which then mediates the transport of beta catenin. If that's true, we should make some predictions, right? First, 
RAPCAF5 should be located in the nucleus. Turns out it is. You can see here nicely, this is a nucleus, Lloydenstaining staining and DAPI. You can see it's very nicely located in the nucleus. In addition, there should be multiple RAPs in the nucleus, and the RAPs that are in the nucleus should be activated RAPs, right? They should be in the RAP GTP form. To look for that, we use this, this construct called RAL GDS. So RAL GDS binds to active wraps, but not to inactive wraps. This has been shown by many other groups. And if we make a RAL GDS GFP, you can see that there's very strong signal in the nuclei, suggesting that wrap, active wraps are in the nucleus. The next thing is that active wraps should bind beta catenin. So we looked at that by Western blot. We can do a RAL GDS pull down, right? So we can pull down the active wraps. Here's the total lysate. You can see a subfraction. Of, uh, sorry, the subfraction of the wraps are active, and those active wraps actually also bind to beta catenin. And finally, we'd expect active wraps to be able to rescue the wrap 5 depletion. So, one of the nice things is you can make a mutation such that it makes the wrap uh, the wraps be a active mimic, so it looks like a wrap GTP. And then you could also make one that looks like a RAP1 GDP, and we call those constitutively active and dominant negative RAPs. So here we're looking at this gene expression FOXJ1. You can see in our controls, we almost always have normal expression of FOXJ1. If we deplete RAPGF5, we get a number that have either reduced or severely reduced expression of FOXJ1, which is a Wnt responsive gene. If we now take these embryos and inject them with an act constitutively active RAP1B, you can see it rescues. But if we add a dominant negative RAP1B, you can see it has no effect. So it really suggests that the uh, active state of the RAPs are necessary for the Wnt signaling. OK, so um, what I'd like to leave you with is that we identified a patient, a heterotaxy patient, a single patient. And then we found this gene called RAPGF5 in that patient. And as we analyzed that gene, we found that it regulates wind signaling via beta catenin. And so we now have this working model where beta catenin affects the nuclear transport. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, RAPGF5 regulates the nuclear transport of beta catenin. But there's a number of open questions for us, for us still. First, is it import or export, right? So we know that uh, beta catenin is changing in the nucleus. It seems to be when you deplete RAPGF5 loss from the nucleus, but we don't know if that's accelerated export or failure to import. That's something that we're going to do some kinetic studies. We'll actually do photoablations of beta catena in the nucleus and actually measure the kinetics of it going in and out. That'll be a key e experiment that we need to do. The other question is, does it affect other nuclear proteins? So we know that there's a bunch of proteins in the, in the nucleus that don't have NLS signals. And could RAPGF5 also affect those? We don't know which RAP specifically. We think RAP1B is a good candidate, but it turns out there's six different RAPs out there, and we need to identify which one. And of course, for this audience, we've been thinking a lot about whether this might make a good cancer target. It turns out, to support that, there are other patients with colorectal cancers. Uh, there are patients that have been identified with colorectal cancer that have duplications in RAPGF5. So that made us also think that maybe we could use RAPGF5 as a cancer target. So our idea is that if beta catenin is necessarily for the nuclear localization, uh, sorry, if RAPGF5 is necessary for the nuclear localization of beta catenin, if we knocked out RAPGF5, beta catenin would no longer go into the nucleus and then block the signals that would drive cancer. And so for that idea, we're hoping to actually do what we applied to pitch to identify small molecules that might block RAP, RAPGF5 and look for the potential uh, uh, novel therapies for, for cancer. And in many ways, it'd be great to uh, collaborate with you guys because I actually don't know anything about cancer. We'd love to get colon cancer cell lines, potentially, knock out RAPGF5, see if there's increased wind dip signaling, and see if we could knock out RAPGF5 and see if we see reduced growth. Right? That would be certainly, certainly interesting uh, and support our, our efforts to find small molecules. In addition, in this audience, I'd like to tell you that it's really exciting time to be a physician scientist, right? We took one patient, did exome sequencing them, and, and identified potentially a new transport pathway for nuclear transport. And so we're very excited about that in pediatrics, and we've developed this pediatrics genomics discovery program to go out and identify patients that have interesting phenotypes, sequence those patients, and then very quickly go into functional studies. I think what's we're really excited about is that a single patient can be very informative, even though you don't have the huge statistical power of 50,000 VA patients. I think one patient could be very informative from a biological standpoint. 
and you guys see all the interesting patients. And there is this very interesting thing that I would like to do is that if you do find some cool new cancer genes, of course, we'd like to study them in developmental biology. Okay, that's it for me. Uh, John Griffin did all the work here. Uh, he was the main leader of this project. Florencia and Anna also helped. Uh, Saurabh and Andrew uh, did some of the experiments as well. We're very thankful for our funding. Thanks. Thank you.